Welcome to the Botanical Gardens here in Lund University, Sweden. This is a lecture having to do with the theme of infrastructure and urbanity, which is one of the topics which is included in this, in this YouTube channel. My name is Joe Stroll and I teach environmental studies at Malmö University in Sweden. If you are watching this not on YouTube but in some other medium, then I will address that at the end of this uh, presentation. Here we will be beginning with the Botanical Gardens, but this, shall we say, orientation lecture presentation having to do with four green spaces or urban parks in Lund, Sweden. So we begin with the Botanical Gardens. We will be moving to the city park, Stadsparken. Then we will go to St. Hans Hills, St. Hans Backau. And finally we will come to the Knowledge Park, Kunskapsparken, sometimes also referred to as the Nobel Park. And you can see where these parks are located in Lund on this map. We will return to this map at least one other time during this lecture. This video is not a complete guide to each of the parks. You should consider it to be an overview so that you get a taste for these places. Either that's it or prior to perhaps you visiting one or more of the parks. There have been three botanical gardens in Lund University. The first botanical gardens was established in 1690 this was referred to as the Old Botanical Gardens. That wasn't where I'm standing now. It was more a more central location where some of the oldest university buildings are now. The second Botanical Gardens, referred to in the past as the New Botanical Gardens, uh, were sort of established in the 1740s. This was during the time of Carl von Linné, known in English as Carl, Carl Linnaeus, usually. Uh, and this was not so much a new botanical gardens, but a restart and renovation at more or less the same location. Finally, we come to the 1860s, uh, and there is what is now referred to as the present botanical gardens, and that is where we're located at right now. Because the, the location of the previous botanical gardens was going to be too small for the understanding that we needed to have a much larger botanical gardens, this place, which is located outside the Middle Ages center of the city or town of Lund, uh, was a much more suitable location. So, uh, to get an overview of the gardens, why don't we go up? There are several thousand species of plants in the park. We can see here a, so to speak, classical garden with paths and plots and plantings as one might see in parks established in the 1600s and 1700s and in the plots a variety of plants are tended to. Additionally besides university buildings and the classical garden layout parts of the botanical gardens are a bit like an arboretum and we can see how the trees tend to be growing on the outer parts of the gardens but cultivated plants and bushes are more often in the interior. The primary purpose of the, botanical, the present botanical gardens is teaching and research, but there's also efforts at outreach, so to speak, and the botanical gardens, there's a strive to keep it open to the public. And for this reason, uh, there are long opening hours before the gates are locked. There's no entrance fee. Costs are paid for by the university and ultimately by the government, um, and the public using this area, which is not primarily designed to be a park, but has park-like purposes and uses. There for this to work, there have to be certain rules. Some of the rules include that dogs are permitted, but must be on short leashes, and they have to stay to the paths and not walk among the bushes. There are benches for picnics, and the lawns can be used for this as well, but no ball sports, frisbees, or similar. Bicycles have to be walked to the park. There are no rules about drones specifically, at least for the moment. In some cases we can see, like here with cabbage plants, that human bred varieties, which are clearly different, but kept together. 
but the botanically uh, related species, they're all the same. Cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, these are just human bred variants. And they're all the same species, Brassica oleracea. Of course, there is much less leafy vegetation during the winter months, early fall, winter, uh, from late fall, winter, into the early spring. Certainly, hardly any leaves on the tree. But compared to much of the center of the city, which was formed during the medieval period, this is sort of like a green oasis, particularly during the summer months. And as such, it is important for residents in the center of the city, including students, uh, for them to be able to carry out some kind of simple recreation, picnics, and so forth. And this, of course, is supporting uh, human well-being as according to the biophilia hypothesis. Here are some questions. Who was Carl von Linné? And which university did he work from or at most of his life? Why is his systematic thinking and research important to this day, both for urban ecology and natural science in general? What is the biophilia hypothesis and how can urban parks contribute to positive benefits based on this hypothesis? In the lecture, the word arboretum is used. What is an arboretum and could such a place be considered a park? Time for me to move on from the botanical gardens to Stadsparken, or the city park, which is located on the opposite side of the medieval city center. So this is the city park in Lund, Stadsparken. It was founded in uh, around 1910, but there were some private initiatives already in the, in the 1860s that led to the basis eventually the city established uh, the, the city park in the 1910s. Behind me, although it might not be very easy to see, we can see the remains of the city wall, which goes through parts of the park. When we think about city walls in medieval cities in Europe, we often think about stones, massive wooden gates. But in all likelihood, the city walls around the city of Lund were an earthen rampart perhaps with a wooden stockade, and then some gates, perhaps not as substantial as what we might think, but there were some sort of gates of some kind. But what's left of the park, uh, but what's left of the wall, we can see in the city park.
When you visit the park, you can see that it consists of several different functional zones. There are different purposes for the different parts of the park. And yet, for the visitors to the park, and many of them probably think of it as a coherent whole. This recreation area, because that's what the park in some ways uh, could be considered, is also connected to entertainment uh, and sports, sort of stretching as an arc out from the southwest of the park. We can go in the direction uh, where there is an, ice, an, an indoor ice skating rink, where Lund's small football, or if you like, soccer stadium is located. There's also, uh, at the very edge of the park, something called the Dairy, Meyeriet, which was an active dairy until the 1960s, uh, was no longer used and in the 1980s became sort of a house of culture for uh, people between the ages of say 16 and 25, musicians to practice uh, and, and so forth. All of this sort of in a sort of an extension from the city park itself. Now that has to do with, now what I've been talking about has a lot to do with people in the park and it is a people-centered kind of experience. However, much of the original part of the city park, the part that was established in the 1910s, has become an EU Natura 2000 location. This is because of the EU Habitat Directive. And the reason for this, and the primary reason for this, is that there is an endangered species in the park. And I have to refer to my notes. <clears throat> it is the Anthrenocurate Anthrenochronus stella. This species is part of the arachnid class of animals. So in other words, um, scorpions, spiders, and the like. Uh, you don't have to, if you visit the park, you don't have to worry about this. Um, it's about two and a half millimeters long. Uh, it does not bite humans. Uh, they require older somewhat hollow deciduous trees. So there is a, a small part of the park where we can see that the city has, or the park administration has deliberately left um, old wood. And beside me over here, which we'll see in a moment, uh, they have left some of a tree. Um, it's about two and a half, three meters high. As, as a mini habitat for this species. Now, this <laughs> Anthronocrinus stella can be found in several locations in Europe, in uh, Sweden, in Denmark, and Poland, but it is an endangered species. Like parts of the botanical gardens, we can see that there are well manicured paths and that there are plots for growing flowers and so forth. This has some sort of inspiration from 16, 1700s English and French parks and perhaps further back into the past. The paths in the grid in the park may be running parallel to each other. In some cases there may be diagonals, in other cases there may be curved arches connecting the edges of the, uh, connecting at the edges of the park some of the paths. One of the ideas of course was that in the late 1800s, beginning of the 1900s, that the upper and middle class would be walking in the park and they would be socializing and they would be looking at small statues and monuments and beautiful plantations of trees, beautiful plantings of trees and flowers and so forth, and be inspired by this. And so this was sort of entertainment on the weekends and at other times for the upper and middle class and there are some of those ideas and some of the pretensions. During the latter part of the 1900s, some sort of a theater, a, a, a concrete kind of stage was established. And then much later into this century, in the 2010s, 2020s, a place for bouldering and a skate park was established and so the city park was expanding. This was either by absorbing or amalgamating other kinds of green spaces and giving them new uses. 
There is a, used to be an observatory turned into a planetarium and the park and that building itself became part of the city park. An aviary was established in the 1990s, I believe. Parks are established for some particular reason or purpose, or perhaps several, and there's a particular design and area for the park. Sometimes these places can be almost conserved like a museum, but other times the, there are changes that are made in the park to correspond to new needs. Using a metaphor like uh, growth rings on a tree, and that we can see a tree during certain periods of time is growing at a particular pace and there might be certain years because of drought or whatever that the growth rings much be much, might be much smaller. We can think of this as in a sort of an analogy with the city park in this case and in other kinds of parks. Here the park began an initial area and has expanded and incorporated other green spaces some parts of the park have been relatively unchanged, like I said. Other parts have changed quite a lot. The children's playground looks quite different now than it did in the 1990s, for example. Uh, the general geometry of the paths and so forth are essentially the same. Uh, certain features have been moved. Others have become less important. Um, and as people's interest in some kinds of forms of recreation has changed, then the park needs to adapt itself in some ways, that some parts of the park get new purposes. And that's a good idea. So we can find evidence of continuity, but also change. If you walk around in the city park in Lund and can find examples of that, and you know the history of the city park. But now I have some questions. The city park hosts, for lack of a better word, one of the larger annual so-called spontaneous uh, parties or picnics outdoors at the end of April and beginning of May in Lund. Try to find out who generally participates in this so-called spontaneous event. What happens during this event? What kind of challenges are there to those that manage the park? And what kind of solutions are possible? You might need to consult various websites in Swedish to be able to learn about this. For students in the Environmental Studies program at Malmö University, I'd like to refer you to back to the Habitat Directive and the City Park in Lund. So a large part of the City Park in Lund, the original area from the 1910s, um, is a Natura 2000 area because of the EU Habitat Directive and because of one particular species. However, the city of Lund, the municipality of Lund, has not made the city park or any part of it a municipal nature preserve, Kumanola Natura Savot. Why is that? And if the city was going to do that, what do you think might happen to the city park? Something might change. What do you think that might be? So, I'll leave with some more aerial views of the city park. Here we are at Sankt Hans Bakka, 
St. Hans Hills. This park here was established in the 1970s. What we used to have here was a large garbage dump, which was on the very edge of the city of Lund at the time. And of course it was then covered over and it was turned into a recreational area. What we can see, hopefully, is that we're sort of at the top and in the winter time if there is enough snow there's the possibility of sled riding, toboggans, cross-country skiing and so forth in large areas of this park. So originally a lot of the park consisted of this grass cover and then there were trees and bushes that were planted in various places. From the very top of St. Hans Hills. You're at one of the higher points in Lund and you can get a very nice overview over parts of the city and the surrounding countryside. And on a clear day, which obviously this is not, it's possible to see Copenhagen or at least parts of Copenhagen sticking up at the horizon. Sorry about all the sounds from traffic. There's a sort of an inner ring road close by uh, and it's more or less impossible to film without picking up some of that sound. If we go down the hill it should become much quieter. As I said before, this was a landfill site. Uh, and when uh, it was turned into a park, not much effort was taken other than landscaping and planting trees and so forth. Uh, using our terminology today, maybe we would say that the park was not developed all that much. The city didn't put all that much money into it. It was just enough to cover over the landfill and make it into a simple recreation area. And an area that had a bit of a do-it-yourself kind of quality to it as opposed to, as we have seen, the city park and the botanical gardens. Nice paths, nice uh, plots of land to look at and so forth. This area was going to be more devoted to more active kinds of recreation and this park was destined to become one of the largest, if not the largest, parks in Lund. As opposed to the botanical gardens and the city park that we've seen before, this park was much less organized. We find here today, in 2022, no toilets, or for more prudish North Americans, no restrooms. There is no cafe, like we could find otherwise in both the Botanical Gardens and the City Park, uh, or there is no kiosk or concession stand, or whatever you want to call it, uh, temporarily during the summer half of the year, uh, which could then be used for selling you know, something to drink and perhaps ice cream or something like that. So initially, in, shall we say, the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, the park was sort of left to itself. The city put minimal effort into it. Visitors did whatever they wanted, so to speak. And the city of Lund began to expand northwards and completely surround the park. So from being a somewhat peripheral park in the city, it now became, well, not exactly central, but somewhat centrally located, as opposed to being actually in the countryside. So at this time, it was less perhaps of an urban park and more of a recreational area that just happened to be located on the edge of Lund. But now it is increasingly, perhaps, uh, in the transition towards something which would be more like an urban park being surrounded by the city. During the last 20 years or so, um, the city's interest has changed for a variety of reasons, uh, in no particular order. Uh, about 10 years ago, this is 2022 now, uh, it was discovered that leachate had uh, left the landfill and was contaminating a small stream flowing north out of the park. Uh, and so there was an effort made to excavate and recap, so to speak, and take care of this problem. Uh, as we all know, those of us who 
teach or study environmental studies, all landfills sooner or later leak. Uh, that's just the way it is. Um, and we have to assume that, even though the industry claims that now they have state-of-the-art. Yeah, well, they were claiming state-of-the-art in the 1970s, and that's what we got us all around the world. So, um, on the eastern and northern margins of the park, um, there were schools and daycare centers that wanted to be, instead of just informally use the park, they asked the city if they could formally use parts of the park. In other words, they might be able to have a, a small garden that the children could uh, tend to uh, as, a, as a sort of more pedagogical kind of endeavor uh, and other kinds of activities. Uh, the park essentially has no illumination uh, except on the edges if there's a bicycle path which is going on the edge of the park. Uh, there are paths, uh, but it was only recently in 2021 that the city established what we could say a more active and master plan for the park. Uh, the uh, amphitheater, this sort of area that was um, formed after the landfill was capped, uh, which informally has been used uh, for a number of informal activities, uh, the city is in the process of changing it to something more like a formal amphitheater with a plan of having, say, a room for 150 to 200 people or so. Uh, attending a small event, uh, besides the impromptu, spontaneous, and informal events which may take place there. Um, a number of the paths uh, are going to be improved to be, uh, make the more weather, shall we say, more accessible all year round, less risk of a puddle. Uh, more, some of them will be made, uh, from what I understand, more wheelchair accessible. Uh, we know there are other parks that are very well designed for people who are handicapped, this one was not. It's very much the sort of, at the time, in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, this is just abandoned land and we'll make it into a park and then that's that. Other parts of the plan uh, will be to uh, put in um, uh, tennis courts on the edge of the park um, while retaining this more um, recreational, do-it-yourself uh, area in the middle. Uh, I've showed something about frisbees. Some frisbee golf. Uh, that frisbee golf has been around for a number of years. Uh, and uh, an adult outdoor gym will be established someplace in the park. Uh, there will be uh, some illumination, some playgrounds and so forth. So what we see is that the park is moving in the direction of being something of a hybrid from something that otherwise would be a recreation area that we might find at some distance from a city or an area that people would have to get in their cars to and go to, uh, to being a much more urban park, much more central, that there is some sort of transformation which is slowly starting to take place here. There was an area that was called the Children's Forest, also connected to the schools and daycare centers, like you said before. And now this is going to be revamped and called an urban forest. I'll let you discover that itself. What is different here compared to the botanical gardens and, um, and the city park, uh, from what I've said before? Well, one of the, one, something which is very different is that there's no geometric pattern of paths. Um, they follow the landscape, winding between small hills or mounds, or going directly up over the mound to the top and then down again. Uh, so the philosophy behind how people have been moving around in the park is very different compared to the city park and the botanical gardens. And in general, this is an area where it's intended to be a much more active kind of recreation as opposed to the other areas. The idea is that it's, it's a much more leisurely kind of recreation that, that, that people can do. I thought I'd show some more drone footage from uh, St. Hans Hills.
So here are some questions. How common is it for landfills or similar locations to be covered up, decommissioned, and turned into parks? Do you know of a location similar to St. Hans Hills, where leachate left the site and contaminated, which then required some sort of remediation? What is more appealing to you personally? <clears throat> Should we have a park that starts with a master plan, and then we follow this design and usage from the start, sort of like the city park, uh, and then afterwards have a slow evolution in form and function to meet new times, interests, and needs on the part of the populace? Or should we have a park which starts out with all, not all that much planning, like this park here, and then as people start using the park, the city should start formalizing zones for use based on how people are actually using the park. It would be a more use-driven development from the start. Why? Why do you prefer one over the other? Or that's something you haven't thought about. Or maybe we could have a large enough park where parts of it would be decided according to a master plan from the start, and other parts would sort of develop as, uh, and, and as people use it, and then the city would uh, to attempt to make changes so it would be in line with what the citizens in the area wanted to do in the park. So, time to go to the last park, or... So, time to go to the fourth park. So, time to go to the fourth park. Now we come to the fourth park, uh, the Park of Knowledge, the Knowledge Park, Kunskapspark. This park is so new as of August 2022 when I'm doing this recording. Um, the park isn't formally opened yet, so I'm actually not supposed to be here, so to speak. It's first in September that it will be inaugurated and formally open. This park is located in the northeast outskirts of Lund. Uh, just beside the tram, just beside the tram or streetcar line, which was opened in 2021. In some ways, we can see the location of this park in the 2020s as being somewhat similar to the location of St. Hans Hills in the 1970s on the outskirts of Lund. But the city grew up around it, and now we can expect here in the coming decades there will be some sort of an expansion as well. In some ways parts of the park attempt to make a 2020s version of for, say the city park. Long paths that in some parks would end with views of buildings or fountains. In this case there is a large man-made hill on the northern part of the park uh, which is sort of where our view is drawn to and um, where a number of the more important paths lead to the hill. On the other hand, while there will be some who will be walking on these paths almost like promenades, there are more meandering paths that don't conform to this. So therefore it's sort of a cross between the neatly organized botanical gardens and the city park and St. Ha Hans Hills, St. Hans Baca. Also, compared to other parks, that we have seen, 
It's been purposely planned that there'll be allotments in the park. Right now, they are, have metal, meadow, meadows growing in them, so to speak. Uh, presumably, uh, sometime after the winter when the park has been established, then these allotments will be uh, available for people to rent. Now you ask yourself, what is an allotment? The, the idea of allotments, and I'm using the UK or British English word for this, is that you have plots of land with water provided where residents in the city are able to rent land and grow crops on it. In some cases, these allotments instead are that, that an association of people buys or rents the land for the city and then rents out the plots to the people who are members of the association and that you can actually erect a small building, like a glorified hut to store tools in and lawn chairs and things like that. If we think about people who live in the center of a city um, and uh, in apartments and they have no way of growing some of their own food or just for fun doing that, like people in suburbs in some places in the world have large lawns where they could grow some food on it, this is an alternative. In the 1880s and the 1920s, if you had crowded, unhygienic city centers, it would be a way for people living in those crowded apartments to be able to get out into the fresh air of the countryside and uh, grow some of their own food and can that and have that for the winter time. Now, of course, there are allotments, not necessarily for that reason, but also for, shall we say, ecological education reasons. It's good for us, or at least for some of us apparently, to be able to grow some of our own food, even if it is only a certain percentage of the food that we consume per year. We have some sort of connection to things that are growing, even if we never make it to a national park. And this idea of practice of allotments began someplace, perhaps in Germany and the Netherlands in the 1800s, and it spread to a number of countries, at first in Northern and Central Europe. So today, it's not all that difficult to find allotments in and around cities if you're in the UK, Sweden, Denmark, Germany, for example. Uh, it's ended up being quite windy today, uh, so that's why there's not so much drone aerial views, because it's a little too gusty sometimes for, the wind, for the dr my little drone to manage that. Um, and I uh, apologize if you're getting too much of the wind here. But I'm a bit of a tight schedule. I've got to finish making these recordings today. Um, also, somewhat differently compared to some parks where the trees are selected because of their beauty and their flowers or whatever it is that landscape architects do, there are parts of this knowledge park where they have deliberately planted fruit trees. So there's this connection with uh, having edible things in this park as opposed to just being a place for recreation and wonderful walks looking at things or walking your dog. Now again, as I mentioned, that there were sort of extensions from the schools and daycare centers uh, in the valley, in the northern part of St. Hans Hills, St. Hans Bacca, um, but that was something that was added on on the initiative of the schools and the daycare centers. Here we see it deliberately planned from, from the beginning. We can also um, if you explore the park um, in a few years, it might be more obvious that there are clear zones, places for more traditional recreation like playgrounds and, and so forth, other places that will be zones for people to walk their dogs on a longer leash. Um, and uh, then we have these edible parts with growing crops and the fruit trees. Another difference is that clearly there's a lot more water here um, with this very large pond and this, um, and the pond and uh, some of the, well, in August 2022, dried out tiny rivulets or streams flowing into the pond. Um, that flows then on to an actual natural small stream which flows into a nature preserve further away. So there will be some sort of connection to the green nature outside of the city uh, preserved in some form of nature preserve. Now the name of this park, as I said, is Kunskopspark and the Park of Knowledge or Knowledge Park. And one of the, the reasons it gets this name is because of the research facilities 
that were established or in the process of being established at more or less the same time as the park. Just like the case with St. Hans Barca, and to somewhat of a lesser extent the city park, it's possible to have a lot of active recreation at the Kunstkopfsparke. And here we can see staff members from the ESS and MAX4 at an event uh, with a picnic and a race. This was during April 2022. Time for a question about the park. Time for a question about the knowledge park. Why do you suppose there is such an emphasis on allotments at this time? And then a question having to do with all the parks. Would you be able to compare and contrast the parks? Would you be able to talk about the similarities and differences with regard to several parameters and factors? And finally, if you are going to visit these parks, what are the places in the various parks that you're most interested, interest, most interested in seeing? Thanks for watching. If you want to see more from this channel, here are some suggestions.